your head from the shocking fact. The teenage party, where anything goes for a thrill. Nature abhors a vacuum. As parental influence declined, something had to step in and help young people make sense of the world. They needed a voice, a cultural identity, something that had an aura of power and authority they could call their own. In the early 1950s, they found it. It's not like the revolution was planned. It just so happened that as the century progressed, as the youth subculture got bigger, richer, and more defined, the technology for recording and broadcasting sound was also coming into its own. Like any business, its leaders were looking for a product and a market that would secure their fortunes. Hey, Steve, we must be out of our cotton picking mind. We should be getting some sleep instead of coming here. Maybe so. But something's getting these people out of their houses. I'm going to find out what it is. Enter rock and roll. The youth subculture had found its voice, a collective experience that served to both re as well as shape their view of the world. Rock and roll is cool, Daddy, and you know it. Musicians became symbols of power as well as role models, filling in for the fathers who were either not around or who were being crowded out by the anti-adult bias beginning to simmer beneath the surface of youth culture. Junior was suddenly more likely to want to be like Elvis than like dear old Dad. Don, uh, it's our feeling here in Jersey City that... This rock and roll rhythm is filled with dynamite. The fact that parents didn't often care much for this new music only made it seem that much more attractive. Traditional values were becoming increasingly uncool. Of course, it's not like the West had never seen a cultural shift along generational lines before. Styles change, tastes evolve, and every generation needs to find its own voice. But never had the glue of family grown so weak. Never had technologies existed that could broadcast so many ideas and temptations over such great distances and do it immediately. Hi, everybody. How are you all? This is yours truly, Alan Freed, welcoming you to the Big Beat. As the decade progressed, another suitor began to court the youth audience. Hollywood had suffered a decline in movie revenues as a result of television and had begun scrambling to fill seats. Market research found that not only were the baby boomers booming in numbers, they also had more money than ever before, a lot more. Youth-oriented films began to come off the assembly line at ever-increasing rates, provoking one industry executive to complain, teenage tastes are exerting a tyranny over the industry. It's getting so show business is just one big puberty right. I mean, you realize who goes to see movies. 80% of them are between the ages of 12 and 22. And you know what kids like? What? Well, this may sound silly to you, but kids go completely ape if you do three things in a picture. Defy authority, destroy property, and take people's clothes off. Gradually, this tyranny spread to television as well. Increased competition, most notably during the expansion of cable in the late 80s, began to redirect industry attention to a teenage audience that watched 30 plus hours of TV a week and had over $75 billion a year to spend. Perhaps even more significantly, studies also showed that young people were much more susceptible to the appeals of advertising. As a result, even though a show like Murder, She Wrote could deliver a larger audience share than Beverly Hills 90210, a 30-second ad on the latter was worth some $30,000 more, simply because it could deliver a more vulnerable audience. As ABC research whiz Alan Wurzel told TV Guide in 1992, we're going for the young market for the same reason Willie Sutton robbed banks. That's where the money is. As we close out this century, the powerful symbiotic relationship between youth culture and the entertainment industry shows no signs of abating. Today, the average teen spends less than one hour a week learning from his or her father, but spends 40 hours and $30 a week on entertainment. Total expendable income is approaching $100 billion a year. And the entertainment industry, for the most part, has shown a willingness to do whatever it has to to get that money. And it's here where our story begins to turn into a nightmare. As the 1950s began, most parents viewed the love affair between youth culture and the electronic media as little more than a nuisance. After all, most kids were still decent enough, and the entertainment, when they bothered to check it out, seemed fairly harmless. Perhaps more importantly, for busy parents in a busy world, 
the occasional negative element seemed a small price to pay for something that kept the kids occupied. And so, amid all the prosperity and freedom of the modern era, a slow chain reaction began to take place. Within the newly constructed enclave of adolescent culture, kids were left more and more to do what kids do when given the chance, have fun and see what they can get away with. And the entertainment industry, driven like any business to make a profit, gave their young audience what they wanted. You want to see life as one big party? You want to celebrate youth and more or less write off the adults? How about fighting the system? After all, it's messed up, isn't it? What about sex? You interested? These types of messages, as tame as they are by today's standards, serve to reinforce and then gradually define teenage attitudes, behavior, and culture. The mirror that Hollywood and the music industry held up before the face of young America turned out to be a magic one, with the power to transform as well as reflect. In the 27th chapter of Proverbs, God warns, hell and destruction are never full. In the same way, the eyes of a man are never satisfied. Hell's hook was now firmly set in the mouths of both artists and audience. Hollywood wanted the money, and teenagers wanted to be entertained. But it had to be new. It had to be bigger and faster and wilder and crazier and sexier and grosser than the time before. The devil's very good at what he does. He's had plenty of practice. And like any good fisherman, he knows you have to be careful not to jerk the line, or it might break. If you want to land the fish, you do it slow and easy. In a decade when only a small minority of misfits are sexually active, perverting takes patience. A little innuendo here, some titillation there, a gradual application of pressure, and there's no telling how far you and your prey can go. Teenage kids living it up and doing things they can never live down. If you're the devil and you get lucky, you may even be able to turn things around so far that it becomes the few misfits who aren't sexually active. I never make it with anyone. I'm a... you know. You are? For real? This is the Orthos Forum, and we approve this message.